what's in the homework assignments versus what is um, the examples in the book, at least the examples that we've seen so far. All right. First of all, there was a question, good question, and I gave an answer. Then I thought, I'm going to go and Google it and make sure my answer was right, <laughs> which, is, which is always uh, a nice... Uh, But I gave the answer and I thought, you know, there's possible that there's something I'm missing, you know. But you had asked the question about there being properties like in C sharp. And um, if you look, um, did some Googling and the consensus seemed to be, no, there are not properties in C sharp. All right, or, or I'm sorry, in Java. In other words, you have to create your own get and set method. All right, and typically it'll be very straightforward. The get will return the value of it. The set will um, take a argument and store that argument in the pro in the property or attribute. But it's not like in C sharp. Now, an advantage of that is you can put all sorts of na of uh, validation in there. The throw exceptions. So if you write your own getters and setters, which again the the strictly speaking terminology is accessor and mutator methods. But you could put and throw exceptions if, for example, you set a value to something that wasn't legit for, for it. So, for example, if you had a, a payroll example and you're calculating payroll and someone put in more than 25 hour, 24 hours worked in a day, you know, you could throw an exception and say, hey, you can, can't work 25 hours in a day or whatever. So, again, my answer was correct, but I'm happy to verify that um, to be sure. Can you hear me in Ridgeville? Okay. Repeat that, please. Yeah, I'm just about to. I started to, and then I got distracted. It's Alan's fault. Well, you're going to be hearing it for at least another semester. All right, there we go. All right. Um, the assignments. Let me pull up Angel and take a look at them. Because the one thing that I'm doing that in the first few exercises they are not doing and that is creating a separate class to do like the work. All right. And I think Deedle doesn't do that because Deedle's job is to talk about Android and to talk about the Android framework. So their focus is on that aspect of it. I want to, though, you know, remember that this is in the context of, gr uh, of other bigger software development considerations, such as separating your things out into different components and so on. Um, you have two assignments that will, um, your, your second assignment and lab three, both require a, a, a class that you create. So I want to spend a little bit of time rewinding and going back to the tip calculator and then going in and um, seeing if you have any questions about that, talking about some of the aspects of it, um, and then talk about your particular assignment. Lab 3, let's talk about what Lab 2 and Lab 3 are. Lab 2 is you going in and creating If you're in CISS 226, this would be your lab two. Let's look in the right class. CIS 226 is Java, so that I had Java on the brain, so that's why I opened that up. But this is Android development. Homework two requires you to create a Java class to play rock, paper, and scissors. This class should accept the user's choice, then randomly pick the opponent's choice and say whether the user has won, lost, or tied. Connect this class to an Android app. Allow the user to <laughs> Oh, we don't want them feeling lonely. 
Oh, okay. Um, connect this class to an Android app. Allow the user to select their choice using a spinner control. Use a button that calls the RPS object, then displays the results in the label. Display what the opponent has selected and whether the user has won, lost, or tied. <clears throat> okay. Again, we're doing the separation of the user interface with the um, business logic. Could you possibly turn your mic down on Skype? Because I'm hearing myself and I'm, I'm baffled. Thank you. <laughs> All right. This would have the advantage if we wanted to play rock, paper, and scissors in other places within our app. All right. Or if we wanted that logic in some other app, it would be encapsulated. So all we would have to do is plug that in. All right. We have a similar thing of for lab three. And lab three requires you to create a currency conversion object. And you'll create a class or classes that will accept and do some parameters and convert from dollars into euros, British pounds, and yen. All right. Now, if you imagine, you could use this app I'm sorry, you could use this object all over the place in an app that displayed money, right? If you had an app, you might have a bunch of views and each one of them displays money. You might show the price of a product, you might show a shipping charge, you might show any number of things and they would all potentially require you to convert a dollar amount into something else. Ideally, you should design the class. And you should design the class to be reusable. All right? So that if I were to say, if I were to add to euros, British pounds, and Japanese yen, add to it Canadian dollars, let's say, or Australian dollars? Yeah, I think they have dollars in Australia. Or whatever, you would be able to seamlessly add it in without having to rewrite everything. So you probably don't want a function that says convert to yen, all right? Because then you'd need a function for every currency, and if we wanted to expand this to a whole bunch of currencies, you'd have difficulty with that. So again, the idea is, is we're making a component that we could use over and over again. We're not really seeing the advantage of that because we're simply doing the one user interface and the one view that's going to call it. But if you're going to use this across a bigger application, especially the currency conversion, is something that I would see you possibly wanting to do in, in several different, uh, several different uh, situations. All right. So because of that, we're going to make the custom class. Remember, we talked about this last time. The code, and even the Deedle examples follow this, the code in the listeners should not be that big, that extensive. All right? In other words, you shouldn't be doing logic in the listeners. Why? Well, again, that sort of binds together or tethers the user interface with my business calculation. It's much better if it lives somewhere else. So, generally speaking, the, less, the listeners should gather the input that's needed, call some functions, and then store the results somewhere. Shouldn't do the actual work. It's sort of like a boss function, right? The, the boss uh, of, a, of a company ideally doesn't do the work themselves, but rather directs who does what and controls and makes sure things flow in the, in the proper sequence. All right, so let's look and let's explore Let's, let's re-explore the second tip calculator example with that in mind. Yes. 
Oh, I'm, my mistake. I did not. Um, I did not share my screen. All right, and I didn't turn my video on either. There we go. Thank you. All right, and we saw that calculator. It it just allows me to choose from a radio button um, uh, or a drop down what the um, what the level of service was allows me to put in a text box a amount and then it does a calculation if we look at the listener again we see the listener doesn't really do any of the work other than what I described gathering the data we gather the values from the spinner, from the edit text, and so on. We do any data conversion that's necessary. And we call some functions on our object, which we created, and we do something with the results. So the listener doesn't have any, quote, business rules in it. The listener doesn't know that a with good service we're going to pay X percentage of a tip and with medium service we're going to pay X for a tip and for great service we're going to pay Y for a tip. All it knows is I'm going to gather the data that that function needs, call the function, and then be done with it. So, if we look at this, does this class have any constructors in it? this particular class? No. Um, how can that be? First of all, what is a constructor? Right. A constructor is what creates an object for a class. And remember we talked about object references and we talked about the heap. When we say something equals new in the name of the class, we're invoking the constructor. Now, this doesn't have a constructor in it. If you don't, this is, this is like in the American judicial system, if you don't have a lawyer. If you don't have a lawyer, one will be assigned to you. If, you don't, if a Java class does not have a constructor, a default constructor will be assigned to the class. The, the compiler will generate it. And the compiler generates it with no arguments, meaning it will create an instance of this class, it will create an object, put it on the heap, set the pointer, but it will not set any of the attributes. Why do you create your own uh, constructors? You create your own constructors because you might want to, when this gets initialized, you might want to initialize certain variables. For example, in this, I could see when we create this class having a constructor that maybe set the level of service to medium, just by default, all right, just to give it a starting value and maybe cost to zero by default. I didn't do that in this case, but I could see doing that. So if there's default values, then you can set those via the constructor. Now, since there is no constructor, the quote, no argument constructor gets called, and this object gets created without any initialization going in. How do you create an object? What is a command? Call new. Yeah, when you call new. So right here, when I say mail m equals, or meal m equals new meal, new meal with nothing in the parentheses indicates that I'm calling a constructor on the meal uh, uh, class and specifically I'm calling the meal object or I'm sorry I'm calling the constructor on the meal object that has accepts no arguments. In other words the default constructor. Now you can create a constructor to default certain properties if you want. All right, I, you could do this any number of different ways. 
One thing to keep in mind is if you create a constructor, you no longer get the default zero argument constructor for free. You have to create one manually if you want there to be a no argument constructor. So if there's no constructors at all, Java says, hey, you can't have a class without any constructors. Boom, I'll make one for you. If you have gone to the trouble of creating a constructor, Java assumes you know what you're doing, and therefore that's the only constructors that you want. So you'd have to go and make all of them. All right? We talked about this class before. The rule is up here, these are the attributes of the class, sometimes called properties, not in the C-sharp sense, but uh, as a synonym for attribute. We define these as private. Um, attributes typically can be private, public, or protected. We would very rarely use public, all right, because we want to encapsulate this. We want uh, to practice what is called data hiding. In other words, the outside world shouldn't know or care anything about the inner workings of this class. Anything that you want to do to this class should be addressed through the methods. In my mind, it's like this, all right? I have all these cables here to connect the computer to the projector and all that stuff. Theoretically, I wouldn't need these little connectors here. I could have to have some bare wires coming out of this guy, right? And when I wanted to connect it to this computer, I could crack open the case and go in and put the wires in the right place for that to happen. But that's not a good idea. Why not? Because you're liable to mess something up doing that every time. All right? It's almost the same way with classes. We keep the, the innards, all right, the, the, the stuff inside isolated and private so that people can't go in and circumvent any validation that we put. They have to use our methods. So, for example, and I didn't do it in this case, but I easily could. This is the first example, well, one of the first examples we covered, but we could easily do something like this. Where I'm setting the service. All right, I'm setting it to be an integer. But if I remember right, there's only three levels. There's a zero, one, or two. All right. So this level of service can't be a 10, or it can't be a negative 5. I could very easily write validation here that in this set service, if the argument was not a value of a 0, 1, or 2, to throw some kind of exception. And in that way, no one using this class could possibly shoehorn an illegal value into there. All right, that have to use my set method, and my set method, I could put validation in there to make sure that that data was what I was expecting. If I made this public, on the other hand, then you could just assign a value to it. You could assign any value you want, and any validation that I put in there would be circumvented. And it would be like plugging wires right into the computer. You could do anything you want, and you're liable to do something wrong to mess things up. So therefore, for each of these attributes, we're going to have a get and a set. Why do we need that? Well, the outside world still needs to be able to manipulate these attributes. We just, don't, we just want to put sort of a layer of protection in there and force them to go through the methods to do this as opposed to um, going through um, um, the, the attribute directly. Another way to put it is the outside world doesn't need to know what's being stored. The outside world just needs to know how to get what it needs to get, and that's via methods, <coughs> the methods we choose to expose. Let's pick kind of a dumb example, but I think it's relevant here. Let's say I had a class for plots of land. All right? 
that was connected to a database somewhere. And let's say that and they're rectangular plots of land. They're all rectangles. All right. I could internally in my database store the length and width of each plot of land. I could also store, if I wanted to, the length and the area of the plot of land. And I could compute the other thing. So I could store two things, being the length and the width. I could store two other things, the length and the area, the length and the perimeter. And I could calculate the other things, length, width, area, perimeter, as long as I had two of those. Okay, so as long as I had two of those four numbers, length, width, perimeter, and area, I could calculate the other two. And again, this is a simplified case. No one's writing applications to keep track of rectangles. But the idea is, is the outside world shouldn't have to know what we're storing internally for rectangles. It should simply know, hey, if I want to be able to get the area, here's a function I call. If I want to be able to get the perimeter, here's a function I have to call, and so on. Any questions about this? Every function to review the syntax of function in Java. Or we review, here's the at, uh, syntax of an attribute. Typically, we'll have private. Then we're going to have the type, and then we're going to have the variable name. That will be an object reference variable because it's, oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. This will be a primitive variable because these guys are not objects. A double and an int are primitives. I lost my head there, all right? Just want to see if you're paying attention, exactly. Now, these don't have to be primitives. They could be objects. So I could pass to my RPS um, game a <coughs> RPS player object if I wanted to. I could create and have that as an attribute. All right. Not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying you could do that. Your methods then, all of these are going to be private or maybe protected as a general rule. And again, when I, when I make a blanket statement, you can almost automatically read into that, yeah, there might be some exceptions, but it's going to be pretty rare. All right, so would you ever make a public attribute? I'm never going to say never. All right, but typically you're not. You're going to make them private or you're going to make them protected. The difference between a private and protected is a protected variable can be accessed by any descendants of this class. So if something inherited from my meal class, maybe lunch and dinner and breakfast, maybe there's different rules for tipping those things. All right. Um, I could go in and um, override the, the calculation um, for that. All right. But I could make those variables protected because I could still use them. All right, we clear on that? All right. Now, the methods are going to be also public, private, or protected. You will, however, see public methods pretty regularly because you have to give the outside world some way of hooking in to use this class. Just like there has to be some way to plug in a video display into this computer. Yeah, we don't want people to crack open the case and have to connect the wires manually, but we want to provide a nice little interface that they can boom, plug it in. And in that way we can control it. We can make sure that you only plug in the right thing, that you don't do something that will cause your computer to blow up or short or anything like that. We can protect it by having that. So, Functions sort of serve that role. <coughs> All right. 
questions about this? Let's say, here's a little exercise I want you to think about for a minute, and then we'll, we'll do it, and hopefully we'll get it right. This will be a good exercise because it will touch all the different things, that are, or many of the different things that we, we've seen. Let's say right now, to refresh your memory on how this works, If I go and run this, I have Maybe we'll try this to make sure there's no glare. All right. I have a text box to enter the amount. I have a drop down for the type of meal or, or the type level of service. And then finally I have a calculate tip. And based on what I enter, It blows up because I didn't put anything in and I don't have any validation. All right, that's something maybe we'll look at doing, or maybe we'll look at in, in, in a subsequent one. So, simply put, this is what we have. We have We have a screen. We have the cost of the meal. We have a level of service. We have a button to calculate and then we display the results in a label. Here is what I want to do. And, and we'll give you a second to think about it, and then we'll, we'll try to actually implement this. All right? Let's say I want to add, let's say I have changed the rules a little bit. And I've said that I'm going to calculate breakfast tips a different way. Right now I have a meal class that does the calculations for all meals based on bad services zero, I think bad service is zero, medium service is 15, and then good service is 20, or something like that. Let's say if there's poor service for breakfast, I give a 0% tip. If there's medium, I give a 10%, and if there's great, I give a 12%. Do keep in mind this is an academic exercise. So if any of you have worked in a restaurant and you're, um, you're angry at me for saying why would you only tip 12% for breakfast if you got excellent service, keep in mind I'm just making this stuff up to demonstrate something. All right? And that goes for you folks in YouTube too. You know, Tip your wait staff. All right? It's not like a DJ now. Tip your wait staff. All right. So, Let's think this through for a minute, and let's, let's come up with a list of all the things that we have to change to make this work. 
All right? Think of all the things that we would have to change to make this work. All right, so take a minute to think of it. And do keep in mind that, that there could be a couple different approaches here. All right, we'll have to pick one. That doesn't mean if you come up with a different approach, it's going to be bad. But let's think of all the things you'd have to change to make this work. All right, let's list all the things that would have to change to make this work. Okay, so we need type of meal. All right, it's, and what could we use for this? We could use a spinner, all right. What else could we use for this? Okay, a radio button. We could do that. What else could we use? Any of these are good, right? I mean, I'm not, not arguing. Just for the heck of it, though, let's use a checkbox. Because the way I define this problem, um, is it breakfast, is it not breakfast, right? Now, do keep in mind that we should be flexible enough that if something were to change and we were to change this, we should be able to handle it because maybe that's the next step after this that we say, okay, there's different rules for lunch. All right? So we're going to need something. We're going to use a checkbox for that. So where is this going to get made? Where is this change going to get made? Okay, the layout XML says main.xml. What else will we need to change? Okay, one thing we could do is we could put a meal type or an is breakfast attribute on our meal. Is there another way that we could handle the code? Well, that would essentially be creating a meal type, creating a property, and then passing that to the meal class as a, as a parameter. Is there something else we could do other than this? Could create a class and a meal. I could create a breakfast class that inherits from meal. How do I know if a class is appropriate to inherit from a class? You use what's called the is a test. A breakfast is a meal. So breakfast can inherit from meal. All right? A bowl of pudding is not a meal. So if I, you know, if there's something goofy with a bowl of pudding, that's, that's, that's a dish. That's not a meal. So the is a test would be bad. Yeah, I was, I, was, I was just thinking that, or like, you know, we got like a, you know, when I, my, when my three-year-old kid, a bowl of pudding was a meal, you know, that's all they ate for six months, you know, or something like that. You get the idea, all right? So we have to pick one way, and in this case, there, these are pretty even. One isn't clearly superior to the other, but I'm going to do this simply because that will demonstrate inheritance, all right? What else do I need to do? So I changed the UI. I changed the... I created another breakfast class. What else will I need to do? Okay. I'm with you for about half of that, all right? Um, 
we have to, uh, let's just summarize it. We have to make sure that the breakfast gets the correct percentages. And everything else gets correct for everything else. And we'll, we'll talk about how we're going to do that in a, in a bit. All right? What else do we have to do? Well, we're going to have to change the code in our listener to use the checkbox to create either a meal or a breakfast. Okay? Now, somewhere in there, we're probably going to need to change add some things to the strings file. Like the label for, is this a breakfast? All right? So let's do this one at a time. Let's do this one piece at a time. All right? We could do this in really in any sequence. As a general rule, I do the GUI first, and then I go and do the processing. For one reason, um, if I'm going to show it to someone, if I was developing this for an organization, for Bob Evans or whatever, all right, um, people can respond with feedback to the GUI. Whereas if I've developed a great set of classes for the business rules, your, your stakeholders aren't going to be able to look at the code and know if you're doing it right or not. But they can look at the GUI and see that. So I'm going to do a GUI, do the GUI first. So. Let's go and look. All right. Go in my layout. One thing I found, by the way, is that this visual graphical layout part of the layout in Eclipse is horrible. All right, and it's, it's flaky and it never works, so I never use it. All right. Um, if it works for you, good for you. All right. Right, right. I, I heard someone experiencing difficulties with it in um, Android Suite. Was that you? Yeah. Okay. So let's go in and let's put a checkbox. Gee, what is a checkbox? I don't know. Let's Google it. Okay, Android checkbox. All right, we have all these things in here. And the XML attributes that we can create for this are somewhere on here, unless I pass them. Okay. I thought all these things were included in this, but let me let me look. You 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 might very well be right. Ah, yeah, check boxes. All right. Looks like essentially we can have the same things as a text box. I'm going to cheat and copy this co uh, code and pop it into my UI right here. I don't want an unclicked event. I'm not going to do something special when I click it. All right. I'm going to change this from checkbox meat to checkbox breakfast. And I'm going to change the string to breakfast. Okay. That means I got to go into the string file and add 
a string for breakfast. Okay, is this all I need to do in the GUI? Just for the GUI, not for any processing. Is there anything else I need to do? Yeah, I think we're okay. Yeah, I think we're okay. I think anything else we need to do will actually do, will actually be the processing. All right, so let's run this and let's make sure the GUI um, looks the way that I want to. And sure enough, if we look to this, it's as it was before, but I don't know how well you can see it. There is a checkbox for breakfast. If we look at this, the checkbox appears before the text for it. Can we switch it around? I'll bet we can. How do you think would do that? I don't know. Who do you think does know? Google knows. All right, so I'm going to do Android check, checkbox, XML properties. Oh, inherited XML attributes. There we go. Thank you. Align parent left and align parent right. So let's go in here and say in the XML, align parent left. So, align parent right. It's actually, I'm sorry, it's actually layout underscore align parent right. Okay, thanks. I was wondering why the, or not, what's going on. Layout underscore align <coughs> parent. And then set that equal to true. Okay. This is what happens now that I've started to exercise. I think it's, think it's taken away from my brain. Does that work for you? <laughs> oh, well, good for you. <laughs> Doesn't like that. Oh well. I'm sure there's probably an attribute somewhere we could try. I guess that wasn't as straightforward as I thought, but okay. So um, we have the GUI pretty much the way we wanted to, wanted it to, with again with little tweak that we could do. 
Um, and that would be a good one if anyone wants to do that for Thursday. Show me what the correct attribute would be. And, and we'll be all set. Okay, now, next thing I want to do is we want to hit the code side now. Now that we have the UI right, we want to hit the code side. Now, what I'm going to do is, again, this could be done a couple different ways. I'm going to use inheritance because I think this will make for some very clean code. All right. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to say file new class. I get this nice little thing and I can say breakfast and I can specify who it inherits from. And I can say meal. And finish. And I have my public class breakfast extends meal. What does it mean when I say it extends meal? It means everything that's on meal is on this, except I can add some things for breakfast if I wanted to, if there were some characteristics of breakfast that are different than the characteristics for another meal. Or I override. So, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change this from private to protected because now there's a subclass in play. Do I have to define these attributes in the breakfast class? No, because I said it extends meal. Those attributes are defined in the meal, therefore there's no need for me to define them in the, the um, in the breakfast class. Do I have to define the getters and setters for those methods? No, because I set the cost the same way for a breakfast or another meal. What's the one thing that I have to override? The calculation. So, I will go in to the meal class. I'm just going to copy this guy. And that's the only thing that's different. So when you extend, you code what is different. All right? So if there's additional characteristics or diff uh, additional methods that could be on a breakfast, you code that. If there is a different way to do some calculation for the subclass as opposed to the superclass, you, you code that. So, what's the difference here? Well, what did I say? That this is 10% and this is 12%, I think? Or something like that. Yeah. All right. So that should be all that we have to do to get the superclass. Because a meal is just like breakfast, except I'm calculating the tip by a different method. All right. Now, I have to use that. All right. So I'm going to have to put some code where? In, on the on click event or on the listener. Right. So I'm going to go here, and the first thing I'm going to have to do is do what? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, you're right, I do have to do that, but before I can even do that, I have to grab a pointer to that or grab a reference to the checkbox. So how will I do that? I'll say checkbox C equals And it's checkbox with a B. Checkbox C equals checkbox 
find view by ID, and I called it something like checkbox breakfast. <coughs> but compilers don't like the something like. They want to know the exact word for it. All right. Why do I have the squigglies? Boy, that looks like all the rest of them. Right. Because it doesn't know where I'm using the code for checkbox. Checkbox could be something I made up. I could have a checkbox class because we have checkered boxes at our organization. All right? And it is called checked box. All right? Or something like that. Or there could be boxes where we put our checks. And that could be that. Well, I don't mean that, right? I mean the Java widget that's called checkbox. So to be very specific about what class I'm talking about, I have to actually say, hey, when I say checkbox, I actually mean the checkbox that is the Java widget checkbox. Okay? So now, okay, now everything's okay. All right? Except, now what do I have to do? Now I have to go in and I have to either create a breakfast object or a meal object. So if the checkbox is checked, I create a breakfast object. If the checkbox is not checked, I create a meal object. All right? Try to visualize in your head what this statement is going to look like. All right? There'll be an if statement, right? <coughs> if. Can I suggest something radical? Yes. Could you just create a breakfast object? And then in your if, if you are, if it is checked, then you just cast it back to a meal object and call that help. No, because that wouldn't work. Because if you create it as a breakfast object, if you, even if you cast it as a meal, it's still going to use the breakfast calculate method. If you cast it as a meal and it was created as a breakfast object, you wouldn't be able to call any methods that were on the breakfast object or class that weren't in the meal class. All right? But if you call a method that they both have in common, you'll get the way that it was created. All right, that's very tricky, so um, there's a great thought, but um, yeah, it, it, the, the, and again, that's the whole bit of polymorphism, all right? So for example, all right, um, so I'm going to say if All right, let's again go and look up to see how do I tell if a checkbox is checked. If checkbox is checked, all right. Should have known. I was looking for a check property, and we know that it's not going to be a property. So if is checked, then I do one thing. Otherwise, I do something else. All right. If it's checked, what do I want to do? I want to create a breakfast object. So I can say m equals new breakfast. If it's not, I'm just going to say m equals new meal. All right. Wait a minute. I declared this as an M. Uh, uh, this variable M is a meal. So I declared it as a meal object, yet I can create legally a breakfast object? This is the equivalent of what you suggested. This meal object is this variable m is going to be treated like a meal object. 
So if there was any special methods on breakfast that didn't exist on meal, I wouldn't be able to call them. But the notion of polymorphism or many forms means that um, if I call a method on that, it's going to get the right method. So if I created a breakfast object, it's going to get the breakfast method. If I created the um, meal object, it's going to get the meal method. All right, let's run this and let's make sure it works. All right, because I'd hate to answer questions based on code that was wrong. All right, so let's make sure this works. I didn't typo or mess anything up or whatever. And then we'll come back and, and see if you have any questions. I will say this, this part largely is, um, um, you know, Java review. So uh, Java review or, or an introduction of concepts that maybe you aren't really sure exactly how it worked in Java. Okay, it's firing off. It's starting. I'll put in a $100 dinner or a $100 meal. I'll say it was breakfast and it was average service. So I should get a what? 10% tip, right? Is that what I coded? Yeah, it should be 10%. If this was a meal, it should be 15%. So you're gonna, I, I assume you're going to trust me to see if this works because it's kind of hard to display this on the screen. But if I click that, sure enough, it shows the tip is $10. If I uncheck that and click Calculate Tip, it, tip, it shows me $15. Okay? So we'll try because, again, you, you have the right to be skeptical. All right, $100 not breakfast. I click that, it shows 15, and you probably can't see that at all. $100 and I check breakfast, it calculates the 10. How can we make that bigger? As I sit here thinking of, of, of doing and twisting and leaning and all that, let's just make the layout bigger, all right? How would we do that? Well, I can go in the main XML and I can say Let's look at our text view. Android text size and must be dimension SP okay so 15 SP so let's go in and say Android text size and we'll do that for this guy and we'll try 30 SP. I don't know how big that is. We'll find out now, won't we? Let me do that for all of these. Thank you. All right, let's go and run this. Oh, 
Ah, here we go. A little bit. Might stand a fighting chance of being able to see this. All right. Um, so I go in and put 100. And say it's breakfast. Oh, with poor. I want to do average. It says $10. I say it's not breakfast. It says $15. All right. So this code does work. And all I did, I think I had the projector wrong. All I did for this was gone in, went and put on each of these the um, text size of, of 30 SP. What is SP? That's a good question. I, SP is for fonts as DP is for um, images. Yeah, scalable pixel, right. So it's, it's like a DP. I wasn't sure what the S stood for, but scalable makes sense. So this should ideally, um, across devices, you know, um, device size. Was that, um, it'll scale it based on that number and take into account the user's, um, user's preference. Okay, excellent. And that, okay, you're right. And that's what makes it superior to DPs because it takes in the user's preference for fonts. That's right. I remember there was a difference. I, I was, couldn't think why you don't use DPs for that, but that's why. All right, questions about any of this code? I know we went over a lot of sort of Java-ish stuff for this, uh, this one. Um, I will post this example. Um, this was a nice review because I think it showed, it revisited some of the things that we did earlier in the term as far as like the XML and the code and, and so on and so forth. Again, to sort of hit the takeaways from this, again, clean separation. I put the string in the strings file, the layout in the XML file. I use my find by ID in the listener to grab a pointer. My listener is still not very complex. All right? A little bit of code in it, but no real work. All it does is it calls the appropriate, or rather it creates the appropriate object, either a breakfast or a meal object, and it grabs, using find view by ID, references to those so that it can pass, so it can use the values from our UI to create the correct object and to, to set arguments on that. Can you show your Correct. It's in the same package, right? Okay. Yeah. No. When I when I created it, when I created meal, and when I created breakfast, when I created all these, the package is that. Okay. So if you put them in another package, then you'd have to. Then you'd have to put the import. Correct. Correct. It, it first looks for the class within your current package, then it looks for the class within the, the imports. Good, quest, good question, good point. Other questions about this? Either the Android, Android-y aspects of this or the Java-y aspects of this. Okay, what's the solution for the checkbox? Okay. Forward slash list choice indicator multiple. <coughs> then you'll need a Android button. An Android button? Yeah. Uh, as an attribute here? Yes. I tested it, it worked. 
Okay. I'm not doubting you. I, I just I, I, I just wasn't a hundred percent clear. And then there you're gonna have an at equals at Okay. You know, I, I will say every single framework I've ever worked in, there's like some things that you can do like that. And then there's other things that you gotta jump through hoops to do. Not that not that this is that difficult, but it seems like text right, text left, you know, it should be easy enough to do. Right. Um, you can just use the layout direction of right to left and it moves it for you. Okay. Interesting. Or you just stack over the full article. Okay. And sure enough, it, it was indeed flipped. So, yay. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I remember. Yeah. I'm sure that will come up again. Any questions on any aspect of this? The next example that we're going to go over is the favorite Twitter searches. And again, for each one of these, there's something distinct about it that I want you to generalize. If I remember right, in the Twitter searches, what is new is that there's going to be scrolling involved and the UI is dynamic. In other words, the UI for all the ones that we've had so far are static, right? The, um, their tip calculator had a table that was of fixed dimensions, all right? This is fixed, certain number of text boxes and so on. The favorite Twitter search is I can add as many things as I want and it will add rows to a table to, to accommodate that. So that's really one of the big takeaways uh, from that. So that's where we'll pick up uh, on next time. It would be a good idea if you could look at that. I don't expect you to understand it perfectly, but you could look through it and sort of get a preview of it so that um, we, can, uh, we can discuss it. I will post this example um, up to Angel um, if you want to take a look at it. Again, the purpose of this, pretty straightforward. Again, some of my assumptions were probably not real world appropriate. But the idea here is, is again, sort of to refresh our memory or review or be introduced the first time to some of these Java concepts. <coughs> All right? So, uh, because, again, this exists within the context of software development. So even if the book doesn't, we want to create these custom classes. Any questions? You okay in Ridgeville? Okay. All right. We'll see you next time then. Is anyone staying for lab? Okay.